Hello everyone, this is Experiment Designs in Computer Science, Week 3, Statistical Inference, Part 4, Ultra, Final Video. So, in this video, I'm going to just go some loose ends, answer some questions that I got, um, and also summarize the class. So in this lecture, let's go to it. So, the idea of this lecture was especially the concept of hypothesis testing. This is a way to use data that we obtain from an experiment to make conclusions about a population. Okay, let's think back about the procedure of statistical testing that we studied. This first, we formulate the question of interest, the thing that we want to research, and based on that, we define the hypothesis that we are comparing. Then we define the minimally interesting effect. What is the minimum difference between the two hypotheses that we want to detect? Based on this information, we can define the confidence and the power of the test. And on this information, we can calculate the sample size. Now, calculation of sample size will be the topic of a future lecture. Okay. Um, then we can finally do the experiment and collect the data. And based on the data, we execute the statistical analysis. And that will give me like reject new hypothesis or do not reject new hypothesis. We also have to validate the assumptions. Uh, do, the, do, the, do the data that I obtained from my experiment follow the statistical model that I expected to follow that describes this test? Finally, based on this, I can draw some conclusions and I can make a recommendation based on my results. Um, in the future lectures, in the next two lectures, we're going to study... We, today we saw a very simple case. We have one sample and we want to check one value. Is it equal, equal to this value or is the mean equal to this value or is the mean different from this value? In the following lectures, we're going to discuss some variations and some special cases for this testing procedure. However, it's very important that you understand this lecture. So think about what parts you don't understand on this lecture and make questions on the survey, on the uh, attendance survey or on the office hours. Some recommended reading for this lecture. There is this link from the University of Gulf, Statistical Significance versus Practical Significance. It's a text that talks a little bit more about what is the p-value and why do we need to also calculate the practical significance, the meaningful of the result besides the statistical significance. Okay, and there's a second text that is the assumptions of normality that talk a little bit about uh, how the models inform our statistical tests. Talking about recommended tests, um, I also want to talk about a recommended scientist. So in the first lecture, I asked you to suggest the scientists that uh, you found inspiring. And I decided to uh, every lecture, if I have the time, talk a little bit about one scientist that I or some topics that I think it would be interesting for you. So today I want to talk about um, Florence Nightingale. So Florence Nightingale, she was a um, she was a British nurse, okay, and she made a great contribution to medicine, evidence-based medicine in general. So why? She was a nurse. She was not like, oh, I'm going to be a scientist. She was a nurse that worked in the British Army. And she was also a mathematician. Okay, and It's interesting uh, that she put these two, uh, these two careers together. Now, um, what she did is like she did a great contributions for the professionalization of nursing, the nursing profession. Uh, she is considered to be the person that made nursing more than just someone who is there to help the doctor and actually someone that has a role, a specific role in the healthcare industry. Now, so what she did, the big thing that Florence Nightingale did that is very related to this course is that she had a tireless drive to write down everything that she did and draw the conclusions and put information together. Uh, she could be said that the, the person who invented the infograph in a way. So she would get data, for example, here is a diagram of the different causes of mortality of uh, some patients that she was supervising or some doctors. So she said, okay, this person died of this and this person died of this, uh, but this person just calls like this and she would put all of that together and based on this data she could figure out uh, different things that could be done to improve uh, the the quality of life the survival rate of the person she the people she were taking care about for example oh if we wash your hands before we touch the patients they will die less 
and she could show that by data. Or here's some data of uh, nurses that sh wash their hands and nurses that don't wash their hands. And here are the results of the treatments. And here you see that the results improved. So she started to do this very important push about, okay, let's lead, let's use the evidence to support the hypothesis that we are using. Should we treat the patient like this or should we treat the patient like that? So I think that's uh, interesting to um, study the history of Florence Nightingale to think about how we changed over the last two centuries to use more data to decide how we're going to do medicine, how we're going to do science, etc. A second thing that I want to recommend, this was an article that came last year and I found it really interesting, especially for computer scientists. It's a little bit unrelated to the la to what I talked about from this idea, but it's kind of related to uh, the idea of doing tests to compare, um, to compare experiments. So this paper is called uh, A Metric Learning Reality Check by Musgrave et al. And what it did is that they wanted to study metric learning, uh, machine learning models for metric learning. Um, now, what exactly is metric learning and what models that the models that compare is not really important, but the important is what they did. And this is very common in computer science. So many papers in machine learning and other areas of computer science, they work like this. I have an algorithm and I will do an experiment to calculate if my algorithm is precise or if my algorithm is fast or if my algorithm is reliable. And then I get the results. Now, I need to compare this with other algorithms that already exist. So what I will do is that I will look at the paper of these other algorithms and I'll compare my results with the results that were compared to these other papers. So that's what a lot of people do. Well, what Musgrave did is that he took these results, but instead of just comparing with the papers, he also implemented all the results from many of the different papers again, and he made sure to adjust the parameters, to do the, there's something called parameter settings. So before you run the algorithm, you have to adjust many parameters. And the adjustment of the parameters depends on the data, depends on the, your computer, depends on the architecture, depends on many things. So what he did is that he took many different methods and adjusted all the parameters and run the experiment again. And you can see these two images. The image on the left is the results that were published on the papers. And if you look at the results published on the papers, you can see that over time, the results get better and better. Each new algorithm has better results than the other algorithms. When Musgrave implemented all the algorithms again, when the authors implemented all the algorithms again and adjusted all the parameters, what he noted is that all the algorithms of all the papers, they have about the same performance. So, what was the problem? The problem is that when you compare your algorithm that you programmed, that you fix the bugs, that you adjust the parameters, that you run many times until it was running very well, when you compare that with the results that are on the paper that were submitted last, that were published last year or five years ago or 10 years ago, the comparison that you're doing is not a fair comparison. You're comparing an algorithm that you worked a lot on it with an algorithm that you did not work on it. Maybe, and that comparison is not fair. And you can see here the results. The results were very different. Results based only on paper comparisons and the result based on re-implementing all the, all, the, all the code. So what is a fair comparison? Okay. Of course, the definition of fair comparison depends on the field being studied and what exactly is the experiment and what data is available. But in general, if we talk about comparing algorithms in computer science, there are some points that we want to make sure that to make sure that the comparison is fair. For example, uh, parameters. We talked about finely tuning the parameters. Uh, if we use a very a very detailed method to fine tune the parameters of our method, but we don't fine tune the parameters of the other methods, then maybe you're using some data or some condition that are not fair. Also, discarding fa failed variations. So let's say that you are creating a new method and you try method A, it fails. You change method A a little bit, you try method B, it fails. You change method B a little bit, you try method C, it fails. You change method C a little bit, you try method D, and it succeeds. If you just publish method D and you don't talk about the other methods and all the changes that you did, basically what you're doing is that you are overfitting to the data. Modifying the algorithm is 
kind of learning. It's a learning done by the scientist, but it's a kind of a learning that will influence the results. If you're using the same data and trying one algorithm and then another and then another and then another on the same data, you are overfitting to that data. And if you compare with a previous result that was not maybe done, or maybe not developed on that data, your algorithm will have an advantage because you did that overfitting beforehand. That's why it's good that at the end, after you develop your algorithm, you try it on a completely different data that you never seen before. Okay. Um, also, only comparing data favorable to one of the algorithms or coding with modern libraries versus old algorithms. So sometimes say, oh, my algorithm is much faster than the, the old algorithm. But maybe the algorithm, old algorithm was using an old version of Python that was not very optimized. So it would be interesting to recompile the old algorithm to see if it becomes faster just by recompiling it in a modern compiler or a modern interpreter or a modern version of the language. Also different computational environments, etc, etc, etc. The important message here is the best way to make sure that multiple algorithms have a fair comparison is to re-implement all of them, run all of them in the same environment, uh, do the same fine tuning. Of course, that's not always possible. But if that's not possible, you have to make clear when you report that, that these are limitations of your method, that maybe if you fine tune the methods you are comparing, maybe they would perform better. Also, to make sure that other people can fine tune your methods, it's super important to publish the code of any method that you publish as a research. Of course, you are, if you're making a company, maybe you don't want to publish your code, or maybe you do. But if you are a scientist and you are proposing a new algorithm, if you don't publish the code of your new algorithm, other scientists will not be able to do fair comparisons of your algorithm with their algorithm. Okay. All right, these are the things that I wanted to recommend. Um, I still have a little bit of time. I'm just going to um, comment on some questions from last week. So let's put these questions here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, uh, last week I asked if people preferred uh, YouTube or Teams. There were a lot of people that said both are fine. Uh, we had about uh, seven people that prefer YouTube and five people that prefer Teams. I'm going to try to publish the videos to both platforms in the future. Uh, I made a question about bias in computer science, in, in, not bias in the statistical bias in an estimator. If one random sample from a, if one observation from a population was a biased estimator to the mean of the population. And many students gave the wrong answer. They said, yes, it's biased. No, remember the definition of, uh, the definition of statistical bias is not that the value is wrong. Bias is not only the value being wrong. Bias is the value being systematically wrong or wrong always in the same way. For instance, if I'm wrong, but I'm always wrong for more, then I'm biased. If I'm wrong, but I'm wrong for both more and less, then I'm wrong. Yes, it, I'm, I'm not a very reliable person, but I'm not statistically biased. It's important to make this difference. Okay, and here, remember, I'm talking about statistical bias. It's a bias about a statistical formula. It's a bias of a formula. A formula is statistically biased if the the error of this formula is not equally distributed on both sides. So if my formula is I take one observation and I say that the value of the observation is my mean, well, the estimated, the expected value of that observation is equal to the value of the mean. So when the observation is wrong, there is an equal probability of the observation being wrong for more and the observation being wrong for less. So in that case, that estimator is not biased. Some people said, oh, it's biased because it's, uh, it has a very high variance, or it's biased because it could be very extreme. Yes, it could be very extreme. Yes, it has a very big variance. But because this variance has equal distribution on both sides of the truth value, then you cannot say that it's statistically biased. So be a little bit careful because of that. Um, these properties of models, they are very important to interpret how we use certain tests, which tests we use or which, um, which formulas we use. So be careful about that. 
Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, is electronic dictionary allowed? Um, I was thinking about it. Yes, I will allow an electronic dictionary. Uh, just make sure that you only use an electronic dictionary to check for the meaning of words. Don't store data. Very important. Don't store data in your electronic dictionary in advance. Okay? If you do that, I will find you and you're going to suffer. Uh, okay. Uh, some people said, please change the video language to English. Sorry, my mistake. I will make sure that the English, this ling English, the language is set to English this time. Uh, some person asked, I cannot understand this equation. What is mu? Mu is the mean. I'm sorry. Mu is a, no, is a, is a value that is usually used to mean the mean, just like sigma is usually used to mean the variance. Okay. Is copying and pasting from your slide to the squeeze okay? Okay, you are a very smart person. Um, yes, you can use my slides for anything, even for copying in the quiz, not in the final exam because you cannot check my slides in the final exam. But here's the thing. I am not grading the quiz, okay? The quiz, I'm not grading. The idea of this quiz is to take your attendance and to make sure that you're understanding the class. So, for instance, in this case, if I ask a question in the quiz and I see that a lot of people are giving the wrong answer, I can give an extra explanation. So, if you copy-paste from my slide, but you don't understand what you copy-paste, then you are fooling me because you're pretending that you know and you don't know, so I cannot explain to you. And you're fooling yourself because you're pretending that you know and you don't know. So, for the quiz, try to answer with your own knowledge, not with copy-paste unless you are absolutely sure that you understand what you're copying paste. Uh, it would be better if speaking speed is slower. I'm sorry about that. If you're using Microsoft Streams or even if you're using YouTube, you can reduce the speed of the video. So let's see if I can show this here. Okay, so if I go here, with Microsoft Streams and let's see my contents and I go to the video. So when you play the video, uh, let me just mute here. When you play the video, here you have playback speed and then you can choose the playback speed to be half if you want. Okay. I will put it on YouTube. In YouTube, you can also put 75% if you think that half is too slow. Also, because if it's a video, you can always pause the video many times and repeat if you don't understand or look at the uh, text. I was a little bit confused about the definition of estimator bias when you say the errors when they happen are equally distributed above and below the real value of the parameter. Do you mean the error calculated using the population X or the sample X? So here I'm talking about the sample error, okay? So when we calculate the, the sample error will be distributed. It's not the error of the sample, it's the sample error. It's a little bit tricky and I, I get confused as well. When I say the error of the sample, I say, okay, I have 10 samples and I will calculate, I will take the, 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 I'll take the average and I'll take that. That's the error of the sample. But the sample error is the error that I get from the sample when I calculate that um, when I calculate that that statistic is the error uh, that the sampling method causes to the calculation of my statistic, and in that case, the sampling error will be distributed equally above and below the value of the parameter. If you don't understand, come to the uh, come to the um, office hours and we can talk again and again until you understand it. Recommend problem sets. I don't have any problem sets at the top of my head because we're doing a lot of things that are very um, theoretical, but I will try to find some. Give me some time about that. I'll try to find some problem sets. All right, um, that's it for today. I thank you very much for watching the videos and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.